Thank you so much, Jerome. Good morning. Is anybody uh, here for the first time? Anyone that, um, can we have some visitor packets down here? Have we done that? No. Two visitor packets right here. Uh, a little later in the service, we're going to ask to come forward and sing a song. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, it's good to be here with all of you. And for those of you that are somewhat new to Unity and would like to learn more about Unity principles uh, directly after the service at about 11.40, um, I would uh, invite you to come back and meet me and some other people that work here. Uh, it can be for five minutes, it can be for a half hour, but just talk and I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. And we can uh, develop a discussion around what does Unity stand for? What are the principles that, uh, that formed it? And what can Unity do for me? As many of you know, I lost a, a grandson in a car accident last June. But then, as things will have it, in July, I was given a new grandson. And I got to meet him this week for the first time. He's four months old. His name is, is Isaiah. And he's staying with me. And it's just absolutely fascinating to have a baby in, in the house um, for the first time in, in many, many years. And Isaiah's four months old, and he's got this little jumper. And we'll put him in there, and his feet hit the floor, and he's able to move himself up and down. And he will do this for like an hour with the same dumb look in his face. <laughs> I, have no, I, I have no idea what he's thinking. And I, I try to uh, distract him somehow by tickling his feet, but he still he just <clears throat> bounces along. And I came to the conclusion and that the thing that he's so fascinated with is probably the first thing that he's ever had control over. He can control his movement. He can't even roll over yet, and everything else is done for him by somebody else, but with that, he can control his own movement. It's like a teenager driving a car for the first time. And so he's just fascinated with it. Never, I'm going to get one for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Some Sunday, I'll just be sitting up here looking at all of you. Well, it also got me to thinking that what is important in life? What is the most important thing? And that led me to, is there a most important thing for everybody and everything that we have in common for all of life? And I came to the conclusion that it is well-being. It is wellness. It is feeling well. It is being well. When we're not feeling well, whether it be physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually, Life loses its luster. You all know that. When you're physically ill, things just don't seem of the same value that they are when you feel good. And when we are physically ill, we usually do everything we can to take care of it. We'll go to the doctor, we'll get medicine, we'll get plenty of rest, drink a lot of liquids, because we want to get better. We don't like feeling physically ill. But for some reason, when it comes to mentally, emotionally, and spiritually not well, we, at times, learn to kind of adapt to it. And we live with it. We think this is just the way life is. Instead of having life as a bowl of cherries, we settle for a bowl of sour grapes. And we just move on down the life path. And I wonder why that is. Why do we take care of ourselves physically, but when it comes to mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, we settle for much, much less than what's available to us? The thing about it is, if we have a strong foundation of well-being, no matter what comes our way, no matter what life throws at us, we can still maintain a position of feeling well. And I don't want to mistake feeling well with feeling happy, because they're two different things. Sadness is a very rich part of life, I think. When I move into those periods where I feel sad, you know, I am okay with it. I can still feel well in that sadness because I know that it's part of the movement through life. When we put in place a foundation for wellness, we can follow the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus wasn't a religious person. He didn't speak from a church. He didn't have holy books that he read from. He didn't have doctrines, creeds, or dogma that he laid on the people. He simply taught people how to live a better life, how to increase their wellness from a spiritual viewpoint. He said, agree with thine adversary quickly. 
And that is a very, very simple principle. Everybody here knows that when you're on the outs with somebody that's important to you, when you're in the midst of a conflict or an argument, it doesn't feel well. And the more you think about something, the more it grows. So the sooner that you can end the conflict and resolve any issues, the better off you're going to be. Jesus knew that. Take care of any adversarial positions that you have between you and somebody else. He said, allow yourself to feel your specialness. You're an individual. And he didn't say, he didn't say you're better than everybody else, but he said, allow yourself to be exactly what you are. Let your light shine. Within you, you have this light of goodness, this light of love, this light of peace that you can shine to the world. So allow yourself to have that, to feel that you are an important part of this place. He said, contribute. Give of yourself to those that don't have so much. And that doesn't necessarily mean money-wise. And your, your contributions here are very, very important at Unity Temple. But this morning when I talk about contribution, I'm talking about giving something to the world, being a beneficial presence to the world. And so it goes, he had this long list of things that people could do to increase their sense of well-being. Well, today, there's a fellow named Tony Robbins, who uh, I'm a very big fan of, and he's taken this same basic uh, common sense approach to life and put it in contemporary words. And he's created six things that we need in order to have a sense of well-being. They're listed on the front of your bulletin, and I'm going to get to that diagram in just a minute, but the first thing is certainty or assuredness. There are certain things, certain basic needs that we have to be certain that we are going to have filled. Every one of us needs to feel certain that we're going to get food on a daily basis. We need to feel certain that we're going to have heat during the winter months. We need to feel certain that we can trust those people that are close to us. There's a lot of things that we have to have certainty in. Otherwise, we're living on the edge, not knowing from day to day what uh, is going to be taken from us that is very important to our well-being. So well, certainty is the first thing, and then ironically, uncertainty is the next thing. We need uncertainty in our lives. If we always knew what was going to happen, day in and day out, life would become monotonous, it would become tedious, it would become boring. So we need those, those experiences of uncertainty that come into our lives out of nowhere, and that bless us with unexpected happiness, or joy, or laughter, or whatever it might be. We need that uncertainty aspect. You know, people that watch sports get their uncertainty buzz from the game. N nobody really knows who's going to win or how they're going to win, uh, except, I guess, when it comes to the Chiefs. <laughs> we, we kind of... Um, but they'll get better. They'll get better. Uh, it's an uncertainty, but I think that uh, next year might be a better season. And on election night, I mean, millions of people are watching television with that, getting their uncertainty buzz by wondering how the elections are going to come out. Will it go my way or won't it go my way? You know, every time we go to a movie or we read a book or we see a, a play, there's a certain amount of uncertainty to it. Like, what is going to happen? How is this going to end? And that gives us a great deal of pleasure. Even when uncertainty comes wrapped in that very dark cloak of the unexpected and the unwanted, like problems and challenges and difficulties and setbacks that come into our lives, still within that, there is, there, there is a certain process that takes place that moves us to a higher place of good once we've gone through it. You know, I deal a lot with people that are going through a divorce, and it's a very painful time. It's a mix of emotions. There's anger, there's resentment, there's guilt, there's shame. There's all sorts of things going on, and it just doesn't feel good. But I have learned as time goes by, all those things that go out of a person's life because the divorce leaves a void and new things come into their lives and fill that void and they discover that they are happier than they've ever been before down the line. In the midst of uncertainty, the key is to bring certainty into it. So you're facing a situation that is uncertain, but you bring certainty into it with the fact that I will be okay. I can do this. I have no idea where this is leading me, but I am going with it, and I know that I am on a path that will lead me to a higher good than I've ever experienced before. 
So the first element for well-being is certainty, the second one uncertainty, and the third one is significance. How many people here, and you don't have to raise your hands, but you can just answer this question yourself, how many people here feel significant? That you're a significant factor here on this earth. We all need to feel like our life matters, that our life has a purpose, that there's a reason for us being here, and that the world is better off because of us. We all have a feeling deep down inside to feel like we're significant. And not more significant than anybody else, but significant in the fact that we are who we are. And it's a very significant factor that we are here right now at this time living the life that we are living, each of us individually, as the person that we are. It's a significant factor that's never happened before in the history of time. It'll never happen again. You will never exist. Your very, your very being is a significant factor. So we have certainty, we have uncertainty, we have significance. And the fourth one is love and connection. We all need to feel like we are connected with each other, that we're connected with life in a way. A sense of separation, whether it be between ourselves and God, between ourselves and other people, between ourselves and, and life as a whole, doesn't feel good. It isolates us. And isolation has always been, been the, the primary punishment for any human being. If we go back to Genesis, and we read Cain and Abel, the two brothers of Adam and Eve, and one of them killed the other. And so his punishment was to be, to be exiled out to face a life of loneliness. When people do something wrong, we put them in prison and isolate them from the general population. If they do something wrong in prison, we isolate them and put them in solitary confinement because it's the greatest punishment a person can face. So we know when it comes to our well-being, we have to have a strong sense of connection. We have to love and we have to receive love. Now, some of you might be here for the first time, or some of you might be relatively new here, and because of that, you don't know a lot of people. But the fact of the matter is, right here, right now, every single person in this room is connected. We're all a part of this. It's wonderful to make that, 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 that transference from I or me in this to us. Where it's not me isolated from everybody else, but I'm part of the us that makes this whole place up. And right now we're all connected because we're all experiencing a common experience of this service. And we're all a part of it. You know, some of us sing, some of us um, do meditation, some of us pray, some of us talk, some of us listen. Some of us snooze. <laughs> but we're all here together. And my point for that is, if you don't feel a strong sense of connection, please visit me after the service back in the Heritage Room. It's on the far end of the building. I'll be there at about 1040. And we just talk about what unity stands for, as I said before. You can stay five minutes, you can stay for a half hour, and we just have a beautiful discussion where the connection deepens because that is essential for any sort of a spiritual life. The fifth thing is growth. We're all human beings and we're all spiritual beings. The spiritual being part of us has potential for us to always grow and always become more. And that is true for everything you see in nature. You know, the minute a seed is planted in the ground, it begins to grow into the design of what it's to be. It first of all germinates, and then it becomes a sprout, and then it becomes a stem, and then the stem becomes a bulb, and then the bulb flowers out and blossoms in beautiful ways. Well, it's the same thing for each and every one of us. You know, there's a design within us, and the fulfillment of that design, the fulfillment of becoming more than we've ever been before is just exhilarating. Life really slows down to a trudge when we stop growing. And growing can be as simple as learning a new word. I went to the hospital two weeks ago to visit a man, and he had a very short time to live. As a matter of fact, he's made his transition. But when I went into the hospital room, he had a dictionary in bed, and he was looking up a word that he had just read that he didn't know the meaning to. He died three days later. But he never stopped growing. It was like our potential is unlimited. There never comes a point in time where you can wake up in the morning and say, I am spent. There is nothing left of me to grow into. There's always something, even if it's finding humor in something that's new. And then, as I said before, the sixth thing 
his contribution. It's, it, you, you, just, you have this, this treasure house of value within you. And to contribute it to the world and make the world a better place everywhere you go and with everything you do, as I said before, it's just a fantastic experience. It's contribute. So the lesson today is make sure that when it comes to all of your basic needs, you're very certain that they're going to be met. Allow yourself to be open to uncertainty. Step out every once in a while and say, okay, world, what are you going to show me? And if you have a setback or an upset of some sort, say, okay, I don't know where this is going, but I trust life. I trust God and I trust myself that it is going to lead me back to a point of very high good. Significance. Feel your importance. There's nothing wrong with that. For many of us, when we were youngsters, we were told it was conceited or it was pompous to feel good about yourself. Well, that's not the case at all. It's conceited if you feel better than somebody else. But to feel good about yourself is essential. God, you have one life. You don't want to go through it not liking yourself or not feeling good about who you are. And then we have growth, where you experience different things that allow you to move into a higher state of being. And we have contribution. Now, for those of you that can't see the front of the bulletin, and that might be you that are, are watching this on the, the internet, I have a little chart there, and it's a well-being chart. And sometime today, what I'd like you to do is just look at that and put a little check mark by the, the number that you think in that category your life represents. Like with certainty, on a scale of one to seven, seven being the best, how certain are you that your basic needs are going to be met? And then it goes right through the entire six qualities. When you get them all done, total them up, and that's your well-being factor, or your wellness factor. And if you come up with 30 or so, you can spot immediately what you have to do to increase your wellness in any particular area. Now, the second thing is choices. Every choice you make has some sort of effect or has some sort of a, a reaction in your world. So when you're making choices, we have to move into a point of what we call mindfulness. And mindfulness is being mindful of what this choice is going to do. If I'm committed to increasing uh, my sense of significance, then every action and every word, every thought and every feeling should be aligned with that to increase my significance and allow me to feel good about myself and my life. And mindfulness is being aware of those choices I'm making because many choices can go the opposite direction. Many choices can take us down a road where I'm going to have a lot of negative head chatter in my mind, where I'm not going to feel good about myself, where I'm going to get down and out about things. I mean, those are choices that we make, and every choice has a consequence. So this whole thing from Jesus' time to, to right here today is really quite simple. It's just a matter of taking a look at your life, what is your wellness factor, and making choices to increase that in all the areas. And the last and the most important thing is contribution. Once you're feeling well, you have much more wellness to help others do the same thing. So I encourage you today to go home and just do a quick self-assessment and make a determination, how well is my life and where are the areas that I need to focus on? What choices can I make to increase that? I'll allow you to think of that as we go into meditation. Take a time to take a deep breath and make yourself comfortable. And just know this day is a good day. It is your day. It is a day in your life. You have time to spend, and you can choose to spend that time any way you want. We all spend most of our times interacting with life. And every interaction has a positive or a negative effect. And we get to choose what the effect is. Nobody in the world around us can choose for us to feel a certain way. That is our choice and our choice alone. Even standing in the face of adversity and rudeness and disrespect, we can choose to allow that to flow over us and move on instead of taking a hold of it and allowing it to increase and exacerbate. So as we move into the silence, Give yourself time to express gratitude for who you are in the life that you have. And know that your life is good, that you're good, and this day is yours to live. 
in the silence. We now begin to come back to this time and this place. We do so with a heart full of gratitude, a sense of high expectations for the future, strong optimism for this day, knowing that we have the wisdom to make choices that will make life a rich experience. And so it is. Gather in us and hold us forever. Gather in us, make us your own. Gather in us, all people together. Fire of love in our flesh. Fire of love in our bones. Fire of love. Fire of love. Fire of love.